everyone. Uh, we'll get started. Um, I'm Gabrielle uh, Gerhard. I'm with the Windermere North Sandpoint Hub, and I'm going to chair tonight. We're going to start with quick around the room introductions. Hi, um, I'm Robert Champagne, and I'm the hub captain in Pigeon Point, West Seattle. Cindy Barker, uh, Morgan Junction Hub, and uh, in West Seattle also. And I'll go for Beverly. Um, Beverly Lighty, uh, Laurelhurst. Hi, Ann Forrest, Victory Heights, Northeast Seattle. Yeah, I'm O'Cono. I'm the hub captain for South Ravenna. Hi, I'm Kurt Guntheroth I'm no from North Capitol Hill Hub. This is Bill Fay. I'm with the Queen Anne Hub. I'm Matt Blank, the Ravenna Eckstein Hub. I'm Dana Armstrong, Madison Park Hub. Hugh Kelso, Kirka Park Hub. Jim, Jim Duran, Finney Hub. Hi, uh, Eric Arnett, Highland Park Improvement Center in Wash in West Seattle. Jody Grage, Ballard Thomas Hub. OC Steve Hall from Belltown. Hi, Catherine Keller, Hummer Harris Hub. Uh, I'm Frank from Magnolia. Susan Sanders, Dejan Park, North Beacon Hill. Hi, I'm Ellen Stecker from the Roosevelt um, Hub. I am Chris Paulus from the uh, North Capitol Hill Hub. Yeah, Johnny Schmidt, uh, High Point Hub, West Seattle. Yeah, Gina with the Braver Hub on Capitol Hill. Stephen. Steve Smith from Madison Valley Hub. So we've been talking about the retreat, which I is February 25th. It's on a Sunday. It'll be noon to three, which means you get a break. You know, it won't be three solid hours, but we will have a lot we want to cover. We'll be going over the calendar of events. We've already got a lot of things coming up, um, skills fairs that are popping in on weekends, but we have some network activities that we wanna make sure that we cover. Some of them include uh, some bigger GRMS training classes. Um, the What do we wanna do about an exercise this year? One big one, two big ones, many small ones. You know, those are the, those are the sort of network things that we talk about to put the activities onto the calendar and brainstorm ideas. We will be sending out a survey somewhere at the end of this month and you'll have two weeks to fill it out. <laughs> and then that way, Anne and I will be compiling the input. And we ask a lot of questions about what is it you would like to do and where do you need help and a little bit about money and a little bit about organization so that we can have that sort of affinitized before we start the retreat and then that way it's a springboard for the discussion. You know, this seems to be the, the things most people would like, you know, and then we can refine those and turn those into specific things that we can do during the year as a network to support everybody while you're also doing your own individual things. So look for that to come out the uh, 29th to 30th of this month. So I've done a, a few things um, when I, when I discussed it previously, I had a couple of options and sounded like we were all um, feeling good about just replacing it with something that's pretty similar to what we've got. Um, there are some challenges to that. Of course, the environment that we have it in doesn't really um, support testing. So um, one thing that I did is create a new um, AWS or Amazon Web Services account uh, for Seattle Hubs. Um, and I've been building that infrastructure out so I've got a, a virtual resource there that's running the mailing list management software. Um, I have validated our domain and I've sent some test emails to uh, verify that everything looks good and it, it does look good and it validates. Um, this is assuming that we're gonna be using seattleemergencyhubs.org in the future. Um, I don't know if we're going to be able to make it come from seattlehubs.org like it's been. Um, I, I don't know that that's going to make a difference to anybody really, but it would just be hubcaps at seattleemergencyhubs.org um, would be the email sender. And that that gets us away from a lot of the complexity of managing two different domains um, and it also um, moving it allows more control over um, the types of identity validation that's required these days. Um, because the the previous registrar or hosting company doesn't really doesn't support those modern um, authentication things that we need to use. Mm -hmm. um, so that's going well. I've been doing a lot of documentation, so it's not it's not quite ready to migrate data over and start emailing through, but it's pretty close. We'll be adding 
a one-click unsubscribe link, which is going to be uh, actually a more of a requirement for a lot of um, email providers like Gmail and Yahoo in the near future. So if you don't send an email out that has this link that they can can read, um, they might just block it and they might um, see that as our domain sending that email. So that's something that they're really pushing for email senders to include with everything. Um, there will be an additional subscribe challenge. So um, I think right now, Cindy just adds people manually. You'll be able to add yourself, um, but whether you add yourself or whether an admin adds you, the first thing it will do is send you an email and ask you if you want to receive email from this list. So there won't be any um, just adding yourself and, and having that be that. They, they really want to verify that who they're sending email to wants to get email because every time they send an email that bounces back, that is a bad mark on the domain, seattleemergencyhubs.org. Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a public link that anybody can click. Okay. It just means maybe there's a hidden link or a link that has kind of a code in it that, that you can send out to people that want to join. Right. Um, okay, or you can still add them manually. I can add them manually. But when you do that, it's not just going to add them to the list. It's going to send them an email and say, you've been added to this list. Mm -hmm. Is this what you want? And they have to click a link in that email to be added. No, that's great. If there's a link that we can just send that says, here, add yourself, knock yourself out. That's great. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I definitely prefer if we could get it done next month. And okay. I think I think I can do that. Um, Um, she has been our webmaster, uh, not in content, but for all the technical issues we've had for eight years. And she was actually on the development team that created the website that we currently have. It was a, a capstone project. Uh, she was going to Seattle Central College and she was a team of people and they, they supposedly work collaboratively, but I can tell you that Patricia put a lot more into it because when that project was handed off to us, the hub person who said that they would be the webmaster disappeared. He just stopped answering emails. <laughs> so we had this panic that we had set up with the Office of Emergency Management that we were going to do this big rollout of the website. And we did a promotions campaign to mm. all the SNAP and BlockWatch groups that OEM would. We went down to the Office of Emergency Management and they put phone numbers in front of us. And we called all the SNAP groups and CERT people and block watches that said that they were willing to get a phone call about this new hub thing. And we talked to them and with, with their permission, they were the ones who were the first ones on the map. So that's the story of how the map was created. It was part of the website project um, and, and putting it all to be ready to be interactive on rollout day was what Patricia and Debbie Getz at the time worked on. After that kickoff with no webmaster in sight, we just didn't know what to do. So it it became I became the instant webmaster with zero, zero experience. And just Patricia, do you think you could help for a little bit? Well, eight years later, she has <laughs> finally said, Thank you. I, I think I've done this long enough. You know, you guys kind of got this under control. Patricia, along with a small token of our pre appreciation, I'm going to send you this little certificate well i thank you so much you know yeah. i really enjoyed working with you cindy and you know i know more about earthquake um <laughs> awareness now than i ever did yep and uh she would come over to west seattle and we'd go upstairs on my computer and she'd give me two hours at a time of here's how you do this and here's how you do this she's been she's been so kind and and such a good teacher in this. And so that's why the website is structured the way it is. It was all around Patricia's creation. And so she's really kept us afloat. And then graciously, we had a meeting with uh, James Baker and, and Matt and Anne, who are the kind of like backup and we're gonna help with the administrative stuff. I can still do content, but I'm still a crappy technical person. So she uh, had a session with them, gave them all the instructions, answered their technical questions. So it's just been great to work with her. 
Oh, I just want to say, you know, it was a great time. I enjoyed working with you for eight years, Cindy, and um, I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. We're in good hands and we really appreciate it. Thank you yeah, so much. Yeah, it sounds like you are. Yeah. So good luck to all of you. I'm going to sign off. All right. Bye, Thank Patricia. You. Bye bye. Uh, so the next item I see on the schedule is Pathfinder reunification event, and that is Robert. We had uh, a really terrific event at Pathfinder. About 50 people showed up from both the Pathfinder and Pigeon Point community, where Pathfinder's K-8 school is located in West Seattle. And uh, it was uh, a follow-up to an event that had been done at Gatewood Elementary School. And I think, Cindy, correct me if I'm wrong, but this seemed like a, a good evolution from the first time it was done. And it went very, very smoothly. There wasn't a lot of dead air. It didn't take too long. And uh, I heard from a number of people saying this was really great. A lot of stuff we didn't know about. This followed a uh, event in November where there was a school lockdown. Uh, thank goodness it wasn't for something real. It was a mistake that uh, turned out to be nothing. But as we have seen, unfortunately, in West Seattle, even this week, it's not always nothing. Uh, Self and Denny uh, locked down this, this week, and that was for a real shooting. Um, so this was all about reunification of parents and students after an event like this. And uh, I know we're looking to replicate it at other schools and groups that want to know. So one of the key things that came out of this that, that Robert and the, the principal was able to use is the Seattle School District had a little video that they had made that showed reunification. And they have given us permission to use these whenever we do any kind of outreach to schools or mostly more like parents. So I'm gonna share my screen. After a disaster or any emergency, the yeah. stress level is extremely high. It's natural that families will want to rush to school to reunite with their children. A large number of families arriving at school simultaneously will overwhelm the front office checkout procedures. There is no video, there's no audio for this piece. Three specific areas as a part of the reunification process. First is the check-in area. This is the first location families will report to. The student supervision area is where students are located while awaiting reunification. Next is the family reunification area. This animation will walk you through the steps of a standard family student union process. Families or other authorized individuals report to the check-in area and show their photo ID. Check-in staff make sure the individual is listed on the student's emergency information form and is authorized to pick up the child. Authorized individual is directed to the family reunification area to wait for their child. Runner takes the student release runner documentation form to the student supervision area to retrieve the child. Runner escorts child to family reunification area where they are reunited with the parent or authorized individual. Runner returns documentation to check-in area. Check-in staff notes the time the student was picked up on the check-in log and their intended destination. So that's where it um, ends. So uh, the, the principal was able to show that, you know, everybody kind of got it. The, when they lived it, like Robert was talking about at the real event, you, you, you didn't have any clue that was all going on. You just knew one point of contact and then it seemed like a mess. And everybody felt a lot more relieved when they heard how that behind the scenes, there was really a, a process going on. So it was really useful. And a lot of people were over at this. Uh, we used the five skills fair, five of the skills fair tables, one of them being the schools. And uh, people were there going, 
I need to make sure my contact form is updated. <laughs> so, so that was an interesting side effect, but it was a great event. Robert and, and his team pulled it off just perfectly. So we've got that model for people who want to do that. We kind of know how to do this now. And as more of us have gone through this, we can help each other if you have a school that you want to get active with. Uh, two questions. Number one, is this done in different languages? And number two, is this something the school has on its website, the school district, so that people can preview it ahead of time? It is not in languages. The question about, is it on the on the school's website? But it's not on the Seattle School District website yet. And then along with that, uh, we created a one pager that really, it's a one pager that I'll drop somewhere in, um, like this all happened the night before I left on my trip. Um, it'll go into some kind of a reunification place, but it practically is the script that you heard there on a one pager plus that graphic. So we have a handout that does the same thing almost. Baby steps with the school system, but we we made a lot of progress yeah. this year, so it was great. So thank you again to Robert for pulling that off for us. Uh, next item is also for Anne, 2024 is the year of medical. For those of you that don't know, I'm a retired Navy nurse, so medical is kind of baked into my system. Um, it feels like the hubs are mature enough to now start thinking about things like, what are we going to do with folks that that show up at our hubs after a disaster injured? Cindy and I have had a couple meetings with folks at the city, and I will just a really brief overview because we're kind of at the beginning. So 2024 is the year of medical. Uh, what we know currently is the fire department concentrates on putting out fires. They don't have super solid plans of what they will do if there's no fires because they are truly focused on putting out fires. And if there's a fire somewhere in the city and that fire area needs help, their goal is to get there, come hell or high water. It makes a lot of sense. They're really good at putting out fires. Nobody else can do it but them. So as far as dealing with any kind of medical issues, that is definitely not on their radar in the very beginning. They, they are using their personnel to put out fires. So looking to them for medical help in the very beginning after a disaster is just not feasible. We also talk to public health. They supervise medical reserve corps folks. That's how it works in the King County. They deploy the medical reserve corps, but it won't happen days one, two, or three. It's going to be a couple days before they figure out what needs to happen, what medical resources do they want to call up, uh, giving them a mission number and all kinds of stuff, and then deploying them. So Medical Reserve Corps volunteers will not be under orders for a couple of days. So again, folks have plans to, to deal with medical issues, but not right away. Those Medical Reserve Corps volunteers around the city, around the county can self-deploy to hubs, similar to how the auxiliary communication services folks can if they want to. They can say no ACS, I don't want to be a ham radio operator for you at this moment. I'm going to go to my community and I'm going to volunteer with my neighbors. Medical Reserve Corps folks can volunteer. They can self-deploy, uh, but they're not covered by insurance in case of an injury. We are moving forward without, honestly, without a lot of direction from the city. We're going to wrap up talking to fire department and public health. We've also spoken with the Northwest Healthcare Regional Healthcare Response Network, which is the, the folks that manage beds across the area. Um, so they're the ones that say, oh, I don't know, Virginia Mason is, is low on beds. Let's, let's shift people around from Swedish or whatever. They do all that shuffling of patients to make sure that no one hospital is completely overwhelmed. Again, they do a great service, but days one through three, they're not really super active because they kind of need to get their feet underneath them and figure out what's going on. So uh, I'm going to clarify that see. they are very active. They are there, but they're not active in the neighborhoods. You know, this right. is, this is our problem is we kind of go day one through three in the neighborhoods is what we care about. And they are, you know, tying in with the army to figure out, you know, are they going to airlift patients out? So they're putting together the larger picture. They're just not active down at the neighborhood level at day one through three. Thank you, Cindy. 
Um, so the last thing on this year of medical is that uh, we're going to start a working group. You could be interested in medical stuff, you know, and have a medical background, or we definitely need hub captains that are not medical folks so that we don't create ideas that are not uh, sustainable. We do have uh, Melissa uh, from University Heights and Ron Angeles from Rainier Beach. Those two folks have been working with us. I haven't asked them if they want to continue working with us. I'm going to try and figure out what maybe can we do? Are there resources? Is there an $8 book to buy and throw in your hub box or give it to the any medical folks you have in your neighborhood? We're not exactly sure how to move forward, but um, we know we need to move forward without tons of guidance. I just say as a retired physician, there are times when I needed to have some kind of reference quickly to do something. And your idea of having a book in the hub box just as a reference, I think would be a big step forward. I'm not sure we could train people and, you know, and uh, anticipate what kinds of needs there are going to be. But if we had some kind of a handbook about what to do with a bleed or what to do with a fever, et cetera, uh, I think that would get, get us a, lo a long way. <clears throat> Part yeah, of it is I also just a guidebook. You know, it's more like a playbook. You know, if you have a hub and there are no doctors and nurses, then these are your best options. But if you've got 10 doctors and nurses standing around, then here are different options. And if you've heard, if you don't know if the hospitals are open or closed or if you can get to them, what are the smartest things that you put up on your whiteboard? You know, so there's there's just kind of like that, that playbook of things you can put into motion as well as, you know, some basic first aid. We, in our neighborhood survey this past year, um, asked as one of the questions who would be interested in any trainings we could get together for first aid, CPR, and all of those things. And we got almost 100% yes on, on that. There was a huge interest in that. So that's one of the things, coincidentally, I didn't know this was the year of medical, but we are planning in, in the Pigeon Point Hub to do that and in partnership, hopefully with Pathfinder School, which will be the venue for it, um, and go through the Red Cross to get those trainings set up. The information I've gotten is that many of the organizations that can provide that sort of thing can provide them to large groups at very low cost, um, really low cost, like you know, $100 and, and 40 people can take the training. Um, just it just covers materials, printed materials, and things like that. So um, I'll keep you posted, and uh, you know if if I can be of service, passing that on. So lots more to come. It's just going to be an interesting year with with kind of finally maturing enough to be able to tackle this issue. When there's no doctor, that's the name yeah. of a book, mostly pictures designed for around the world where there is no doctor. Peace doctor Corps. I think I've heard someone from Peace Corps tell me about that. Good Samaritan law says you can, you're, you're protected as long as you are administering what you are trained for. You might describe why you know Stop the Bleed is available. Because oh, a lot of because, the new hub captains don't know. Okay. Uh, so Stop the Bleed is a national program. The city has instructors. I, I happen to be one of them. You have to have a medical background. You cannot be a lay person and teach Stop the Bleed. So either you were an EMT or a nurse or a doctor or something like that in a previous life or in your current life. But Stop the Bleed is a really, really fun, very hands-on. Um, I can teach it in like 45 minutes. Uh, it's, it's very fun. It's tourniquets and direct pressure. And we've got models and all kinds of stuff. So absolutely Susanna, happy to, to teach groups about that. Susanna Cunningham is also on. There, there was three yes. or four of them that formed a nonprofit. Sandy Mozart and Susanna Cunningham from the Lake City Hub were yeah. super instrumental in getting us models and bringing it to, to North Seattle. So fabulous course. Uh, the next item is the I Am Safe training exercise. And Cindy, that goes to you. This is the passing messages that you, you know, that your community member wants to get a message out that says, I'm safe, and they couldn't get it out before all normal communications went down. So this will be the formal training for hub captains. We'll have the hub captains in one room, 
doing the training and creating messages. And in the other rooms, we will have radio operators and it's going to be ACS, radio clubs, ham radio operators interested, and all the people who can do WinLink messages. And we will be passing our messages over into that room and they will be sending them out. So we've discovered that it's easiest to send yourself the message. So you'll get instant gratification about, did you create your message correctly? Did we transcribe it correctly onto a thumb drive to hand over to them? So I am safe training, does that involve the ACS hams? Is that the, the way those go out? It goes, it does not have to be ACS. It can be anybody who can do WinLink. So any amateur radio operator. And, and that's by purpose. We we know ACS is gonna be doing a lot of other stuff. Forward. The next is um, a report from participants on the Seattle Fire Department mm -hmm. earthquake windshield exercise. So, who's so that would be Frank and Gina and Bill and Matt and Norma who were at the fire Great. stations as as hub observers. Uh, we were on site at the um, University District Fire Station. They had sort of physical maps set up in a room and uh, they had physical cards that they used to track resources, um, such as apparatus, the trucks, and, and the different um, it, uh, companies throughout the battalion or the sector that they were responsible for. It was a lot of deliberate, you know, patient radio copying back and forth uh, between the uh, Battalion 6 command and the uh, different engine companies uh, about where they were, what they were seeing. You know, we listened to some real calls between uh, stations and they were, you know, describing things that they might see on patrol, uh, some of the scenarios that they might run into, uh, and they were handwriting those out on cards sticking them on a wall to track resources. Uh, and they were also placing uh, little magnetic markers on a map of the city to show where things were happening. Um, and just for you know, context for everybody, this is what the fire department will do the first half hour after an earthquake happens. They roll out and they are doing this situation awareness route. So everything that Matt's describing is how they capture it and transfer it in for prioritization and decisions. Uh, basically, each each apparatus or each vehicle has their own designated patrol route that they're going to run. They share some radio channels with police, so they may um, have police reporting information that get relayed up through the chain uh, to fire if it's relevant to them. It's basically a communication cycle. They're all in this loop where each truck is running a route, the station pulls the trucks, the battalion pulls the station, and then the resource management center pulls the battalions. So things just get passed up the chain as those cycles um, kind of loop through each other. They assign triage codes. Just like when we drill, we always learn things. They were finding a lot of things that, like, they're, some of the people they were polling were reporting triage codes as colors, which is a way that they've done it in the past. But apparently, they've kind of tried to transition to levels one, two, and three. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so some of them are just, you know, doing things one way. Some of the stations did not get any injects. So they were making stuff up on the fly. So <laughs> it was just really interesting to see yeah, some of the things that, that came up. Yeah, welcome to hub exercises. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, even the professionals have the same problems. There's also the amount of personnel it took to do it. There were seven people in there, including the battalion chief. And I got talking with one of the guys and I said, yeah, you could have more people out, et cetera. You know, is this really the best use of personnel doing it manually? Um, it was it was a good exercise to understand that all the time that that data is on the board, if there's a fire, if there's a collapsed building with people trapped, until they actually activate resources to respond to particular sites, that's all waiting time for who it's ever there, which goes back to whatever is the snap or preparedness uh, on the ground that they're reporting about that can respond before uh, Seattle Fire gets there. Of course, there's these people taking these calls over the radio, and then there's one guy at the map, and he actually has little magnetic stickers with message numbers on them. 
So you could see this message number is with this thing at this point on the map. And then the other guy has the, all the messages posted on this big board. At the same time, handwriting was not that good. This was sort of the triage board and uh, each of these cards is, so they assign that, they add the location to Children's Hospital, address, the nature of the thing, um, description. It's set up well for um, shift change. So I appreciate that you guys went because it lets you get inside the fire stations, see what's going to happen so that you as a hub captain have an idea of what one of our departments is out there doing, like we do with many of the other departments. <clears throat> and kind of my takeaway is they're busy. They're going to be busy. They're going to be doing fires. Uh, this is before this probably happens before we even get set up. Right. Cause this is the first 30 minutes after an earthquake. And, uh, so it's just kind of good visibility. So hopefully we'll get to do it again next year. I was taking those cards at, from a battalion board, typing them into WinLink software to relay them back to the core where they could do uh, triage and build a big map of the city. And so, yes, I, I was also impressed by the handwriting. Um, and by how good, as Frank said, how good this is for handoff and that this can be done knee deep in water with a headlamp. I mean, it's a really robust system, even if we laugh at paper. So I think there's a, some lessons there for the hubs and how we do our own paperwork and, and tracking. Yeah. The other thing that really impressed me was the, at each step as the data comes in and the triage is done, the problems that go towards the, the city are big problems. And so I think we can all, as we are doing our own radio, we can also learn from that of the funnel of, is this really something that the center can help with? Or is this something that really we're gonna to have to solve on our own? Is there, um, and so that, that triage and filtering was really impressive as part of the exercise. You guys being in there, he came out really excited. So I know that he's, he can see the potential of the importance of connections with hubs. So I think it's a good thing. The next item is the bike and hub joint exercise. So that says Cindy and Gina. Um, but just trying to figure out other ways that we can do it. So we talked about whether they can come to skill fairs and maybe have like a table of for all the people that have bikes at home that never use them to just kind of get the, the idea in their mind that, oh, when everything else is broken, you might want to pull your bike out and be able to get around with it. Um, or or how else we can either get them to come to the big events if we have them or or what. So so nothing specific, but we can come up with more ideas at the, the retreat, hopefully. Yeah, I that is one of the things about when we talk about uh, what exercises we want to do and who we want to partner with, that will be definitely a great time to discuss it. So thank you, Gina, for uh, following up with them. It's kind of exciting because there's a whole lot of people out there who, who like to get involved. And if you can touch their favorite hobby or some specialty, like the cargo bike people are really good at what they do and involve them, it plants that seed for the real disaster. See, the next item is the FEMA game review. It's a game that FEMA put together. It's called Disaster Mind developed by FEMA and then a company called iThrive Games. It is a single player game, so it's not you and a team of people playing. So the scenarios in this game currently are blizzards, wildfires, and floods. Earthquakes are coming, but that, uh, to my knowledge, that module hasn't been built yet. The target audience for this game, probably should have started with that, is sophomores and juniors in high school, roughly that age, uh, which is 15, 16, the game is free. It doesn't collect data or personal info on kids, which is kind of a super important thing um, to parents and uh, privacy experts to think ahead, to em empower them, to get them interested in disaster preparedness and really create that mindset of you have more skills than you realize and you can do great things. So really trying to, to educate our future, you know, future emergency management leaders. So that we have our public events or we go participate in a community fair. We have the Wheel of Misfortune and, you know, it just seems like it would be something, you know, sometimes we have goodies to give away and you're making access to that for young people 
that would be something nice to add to the toolbox. Yeah, I could, yeah, I like that. I idea. could see it'd be kind of fun to have at the uh, make a family plan. You know, say, hey, and you've got you've got teenagers walking through this with you. Here's a game that they can learn what it is to think about being prepared and what to do in disasters. Forecasting a fast moving snow event going through your town. Predictions estimate one to two inches of snow overnight. But this isn't an normal night. It's important that you are here. Natural disasters like blizzards can often end in tragedy, but it doesn't have to. That's why you're here, to change your future. Think of me as your guide. I'm here to help you. At least I'll try. You will need to make a quick, independent decision on your own. Only you can survive by making the most effective decisions that you can. When you get sent back to your world, you need to orient yourself to this system. I'll, we'll put the link in the minutes so you can play with it more, but I like the idea of using QR codes and that kind of stuff to, to engage our younger audiences. Uh, the next item was sharing best practices of hubs. Yeah, Finney is having a skills fair um, February 3rd, which is a week from Saturday. And Ethan Schoonover in our hub came up with the idea to create reusable skills fairs signs. And the bottom is white. The idea is that, uh, you know, we can put at Finney Center, a, a different hub would put their identifier there. Um, there are five signs. The idea is one on each side of a block where the event is and one at the entrance. And then also there are a set of signs that say tomorrow and a set that say today. Well, we sort of made an executive decision. We, we're pulling them out of the network funds because coincidentally, these cost exactly the amount we just got as a donation from Dave Wilma who wrote an article about the I am safe stuff and he got $130 honorarium. So we just went, you know what? <laughs> Let's just use that money. <laughs> Did you have something specific you were doing that was working really well? Feel free to speak up. I will take that school reunification template, which we've done now twice with Robert Robert's group and mm -hmm. put that into, hey, if you want to do your own thing, these are the steps and here's who did what. That would be great, Cindy. found out about a um, <clears throat> FEMA presentation for a religious institution that some of you might know somebody who wants to attend that. Um, so I used it as an opportunity to reach out to the lo local churches around me. Um, it's from FEMA about um, disaster preparedness and in religious institutions. Um, but it's February 1st, so it's very soon. So I thought I'd pass that on. Yeah, I noticed that there are going to be several skills fairs in the next few weeks. Like I know Finney is doing it and Ballard's doing one. And I was wondering, since they're all kind of in the north uh, part of Seattle, I would be happy if somebody could send me or if somebody could create a flyer with the dates and places, I would post them like at my library and community center, you know, if you want to just send me something, you know, something to print and I'll print it. We yeah. can add those flyers onto the follow-up from this meeting. Okay, we can move on to around the room announcements, but I see there's two specific things here. Uh, Cindy or Ann, did you want to highlight those before we moved into Around the Room? I'm Steve Hall, uh, for those of you who don't know me, from Belltown, and it's good to see the people I recognize and uh, mm -hmm. good to see new faces here, and it's really good to be at this meeting. It's been a long time. It's so difficult to have a hub here when there's probably, I don't even know how many people live here, 15,000 people in these huge towers and so our plan is to start having community events, not just for the hub, but start building a community around these buildings and start gathering people to join and getting skills and that sort of thing. So as part of all of that, one of the things we're doing is um, trying to have things to give to people. So if we're having like an art park, that's one of the things we've already done where we just set up and people make cards or art. It's very popular. 
And if we had materials for people to have for the hub, we thought that would be a great idea. But these are young folks. And if they see, you know, a stapled together five sheets of paper, you know, a standard like a PowerPoint thing, they're not really going to to like it. So we we went along, we went with kind of an artsy look here. So this is a zine. So what a zine is, they used to be popular in the in the 80s. They've had some resurgence. It's just like a small magazine that's made by hand. And we can have these available. Or each of these could just be individual things. And it's just kind of a fun way to uh, to provide information. And so I wanted to share these with the group. And this, this was one of them. Now, these are just mock-ups. But I just want to give you an idea of kind of where we're heading with these things. It's just hand drawn. It'll kind of catch people's interest. It's 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 aimed at a, at a kind of a young young audience. And I had a lot of fun <laughs> putting these together, talking about water. And here's our main hub one. And this one I like. This is actually the Native Americans. I don't know the name of the uh, the myth, but they have a creature that symbolizes the earthquake. And it has two heads and a wavy body. So this this was our prepare for earthquake tying in with our indigenous culture, which was far more aware of earthquakes than I think our current culture is. So we hope to uh, to set these up and start building a, a community in Belltown. And um, I, I really hope it works. I think the hub is is a great we've great way to get people together. The historic preservation we had a meeting, 150 people showed up from the community to a meeting, uh, a public meeting. And these people, they don't go to meetings unless they're court ordered. <laughs> so they pretty much, they, these can, can be kind of a rough crowd, but they are, they, they stick together and that community is there. And that's something that we thought we could build on and, and build some resilience. And so anyway, this, uh, this sign was our, was one of the ways of just kind of uh, reaching out to that community and, and trying to resonate with them and, and make uh, resilience cool. <laughs> For sharing, and I see the link there. So that will be in the, um, it will stay yeah. on the agenda when it turns into the meeting minutes. Great. Um, and then uh, Madison Park is having a Hub 201. Everybody's welcome. Part of what she wanted to do in the 201 is she wanted to do medical exercise. So we're going to take what little we've learned so far from the group and build that into some of the injects that we do around the table. You know, here's your scenario. So medical is going to be part of the um, scenarios. And then we're going to cover some radio stuff, just some basic stuff, because they're uh, rebuilding their radio team. Now we can start uh, around the room. Um, Catherine, uh, we'll let you kick off. To get any reliable websites that have good gear, you know, for all the things we, we worry about having. Um, heat, heat, energy, light type stuff. And so, if if people want to email me, I can make a list. If you say, send me a web link and say, these are good with this kind of stuff. So that's one. The second was I have been interacting a lot with HOA related law and my legislator, Peterson. And there's a lot about emergency preparedness. I've joined the local condo owners group. And um, I'd really like to, I don't know, have a short discussion amongst those of us who live in high density as in apartment buildings or condos. And some of the things I found out, like there are emergency preparedness things, you know, books and things for condominium owners. And we have a hub, we have hubs in condos. So I'm trying to see, is there any opportunity to start marrying some of these worlds together with our work and the fact that people who all live in these vertical communities. Mm -hmm. And the third, the third thing was just, I'm going to start hunting around for all your Facebook group and pages and joining them. And I want to, I want to cross post a lot more connected so we can motivate and 
promote each other. Susan Sanders in Bean has a right. very active one too. Yes, I think I got enjoying that one. Anyway, that that's what's good on my mind for Round Robin. Is there anybody from the Northwest who would like to give us an update? As I said, Finney is having a skills fair a week from Saturday. Um, it's shown on the agenda. We could use three or four um, helpers to staff tables. Um, I put the sign up in the chat. Um, anyone here that might be able to help us out on Saturday, week from Saturday? It goes um, 10 to 1, and it's at the PNA Big Blue Building, Finney Neighborhood Association, and the staffing shifts, there are two shifts, um, 10 to 11-ish, 11, 11 to 1, 11.30. Yes, uh, this is Jody. We're having a skills fair on the 28th of February, and I'm wondering if we could borrow those signs. Are they up for... For loans? We would okay. love for you to borrow them. All right. Uh, Jody, the 28th of February or the 18th? Oh, of no, February? excuse me, the 18th. Pardon okay, me. Good. Thank I, you. Yeah, the 18th. Yeah, we did the Hubs 101 because we are um, trying to split our hub in two, have a north and a south garage you hub. Mm. We have the oh. hub box. We just need to train volunteers. So I, I think we've probably are pretty close to having enough now we just have to decide when we're going to have our first live hub practice at the new hub. And that might coincide with what we decide on the uh, retreat, what's coming up. I'm Steve Smith, <laughs> and I'm filling in for uh, Norma Jenner. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, we're also having a, a hub 201 on the 27th of February at the Wedgwood Presbyterian Church. So um norma will i guess we'll have the uh brochure will be able to get out and get posted so any any of those that we would like to attend we'd be more than uh we'd love to have as many people come as we can so, that, so that's a week that's a weeknight it's on the 27th correct it's it is a weeknight I encourage people to check into the gmrs nets as we do those um <clears throat> those are good practice okay. and We've been learning things, um, discussing what we want to do for Fifth Mondays. There's been some interest in doing um, like a simplex nets, so not using the repeaters, just checking to see how people can reach each other, um, or you know, breaking out into um, community sectors and, and practicing with your group more. So yeah, those are things we want to think about. And as usual, plug in Discord there. Just, that community out there. We've got um, an event calendar on there, uh, share links, you know, private channels to discuss things among your hubs. Uh, and yeah, it's been picking up a little bit. Great. Thanks, Matt. Uh, anyone else from Northeast? Well, uh, Bill Fay here from Queen Anne. Uh, not much developments other than maybe sev several of you have known and worked with Paula Mueller. Uh, a very energetic and very good planner. In fact, she was the chairman of uh, the Queen Anne Community Council, uh, but she's gone through sort of a major uh, life change and decided that her and her husband have moved to Edmonds. So they've moved out of the area, leaving uh, the Community Council in good hands, but leaving me one good person short now. Uh, so I'll miss her. Uh, she was a great uh, force in the area. Paula Mueller. Uh, without going into a lot of detail, Bill and I and another uh, one of us worked on uh, training, getting some family service radios and training some people who live along Perkins Lane to use that because that place is uh, uh, predicted to be completely uh, landslidesville over there. And when I went down to show them how to use the radios, I took along my copy of the map for Magnolia that we got through Anne's grant, which mm -hmm. shows up the addresses. And at the end of the conversation, we mapped out what they wanted on a map for themselves from Kroll. And I've been in touch with Jim Locker or Lo however you say his name at Kroll. And he sent them a, a description of what it would cost for them to get the map that they want that would cover all of Perkins Lane. It's about 50 bucks. Uh, there's two retired doctors who are in the lead team down there, or four people. 
Uh, they want to buy one um, so they can start. Going. Oh, and we donated a set of uh, family service radios to them, locked them into a certain channel, told them don't touch anything except the on and off, don't play with them, and go out and have a good time and see where you can communicate with each other along that 1.3-mile stretch using the radios and the map. And the reason we pursued that, Bill and I and, and a friend of ours and, and our team, um, it lets people understand they have some agency with radio that doesn't require a test, uh, a lot of equipment, sophistication, the whole thing. So there's parts of the city where that might be replicated if it would be uh, a useful. So you can talk with Bill or me about how we went about doing it. Uh, we had a disclaimer on all the literature we gave them. There is no association with ACS. Um, so anyway, uh, they've got them, and I'm hoping they're going to order a map for themselves, and we can go back and see how the radio tests are going. Hey, Miles, are you going to talk about the Fifth Monday thing? So yeah, we're doing a Fifth Monday talk to our neighbors drill where we're going to try uh, reaching out Um if any of you are neighbors of North Capitol Hill and haven't received an email, um, please say so in chat. Or if you want help programming radios or practicing this uh, Sunday before next Monday, the first fifth Monday of the year. So can I just ask a point of clarification? Is your basic idea that you're going to be talking to neighbors about radios? Is that what you're doing? We will use radio to see if we can all talk from our hubs directly to each other. Um, we'll okay. use repeater this round. In the future, I'd like to try simplex or satellite or runners. I, I really like the idea of having a bicycle poker ride between all of our hubs. <laughs> okay. So when you say neighbors, you don't mean neighbors. You mean hub neighbors. Hub, uh, closest adjacent hubs. Yes. Hubs. Okay. Yeah. That, that, that's what tripped me up. Okay. Thank you very much. I have one, two, actually. Okay. Uh, I see Nancy on. I'm looking to see if she's still on. Nancy Ishi, maybe gone. Uh, the Peace Lutheran, um, Anna Churchill moved to South Park, and we've been looking for a replacement hub captain for her at Peace Lutheran. So we now have um, someone from the neighborhood and the church, where which is where the hub is located, is um, recruiting their side, and we're going to have a reboot meeting on February 7th to for the community and the church to get together and start to to pull that hub back into practicing mode. Uh, that's the first announcement. And then the other announcement is for my own hub, um, the Gatewood reunification event that we did last year. Finally, we've got um, we've got four or five neighbors. Uh, what the what the school said coming out of that event was we talked about what can be the relationship between the school during a major disaster and the hub. And if they're in lockdown and they've got students that haven't been picked up, you know, what, what can we do? And they wanted to get some trusted neighbors who could act as liaison with the hub and the greater community, or be able to put out the word that says, looks like we're gonna have 15 students who didn't get picked up tonight and we're gonna have to overnight them and we need blankets and pillows for the kids. So we are, recruiting those trusted neighbors so that they could be introduced to the staff and then they can show up at as a disaster and be that known liaison that they can work with to help the kids inside the school. So that is coming up next month. Thank you, Gabrielle, for keeping these Thank meetings Carla. running for us. A great meeting. Great facilitation. Thank lots you. Of good, Thank you. Lots of good information. All right. Take care, everyone. Have a good night.